freedom dream. Here is a vision for abolition, peace enforced not by police, but by oral tradition. Let's begin. Stand with me in sacred circles of your own being. Remember the rivers who fed you and the Mauna who held you till your first tears gurgled into laughter. Remember the Pico who pulled you tight to place, pull you into Pilina with the Makuahine who birthed you and the thousands of mothers who surround you. Remember the tenacity of this genealogy, the ropes of radical self-care. Don't dismember yourself into skin and oblivion, for you are the center of your own circle, Eku. The thing about Ho'oponopono is that change is not content with merely an echo. It demands to be felt, demands to traverse oceans. Eku'u Ho'o'ivi. Can you see the way the vaivai flows around this circle? Equity of time and space held in the unfurling leaves of la'i, ancestral keeper of story and healing. In the circle, the talking piece teaches us to hold our own inoa a little more gently. Rename and reclaim every body in this legal prison, singing our way to abolition. I'm Karen Beastman. I'm Associate Dean and Director of the Native American Cultural Center and Faculty in Native American Studies. I'm from Muskogee, Oklahoma, but I was born uh, when my dad was a college student at Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So I was born in a college environment. I have always known that education and social change are one and the same. So I was born into this work. Tanse, uh, my name is Kaylin Maram. I am, I come from the Woodland Cree peoples and the Mandan Hidatsa. I'm originally from Montana and I am currently a co-terminal master's student in the sociology program at Stanford. Hello, my name is Carson Smith. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I graduated from Stanford University in 2019 and I'm currently working at the university in a position called the Conflict Resolution Fellow. I'll be starting law school here in the fall of 2022. <laughs> Uh, aloha oi, I'm Buddy, I am from Hawaii, I'm Kanaka Maori, and I am part of the diaspora also of Native Hawaiian, so I grew up partially in California. I am a current senior at Stanford University studying human biology and also studying Native Studies as a minor. I'm Brett Lee Shelton, I'm a member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and I'm a staff attorney for the Native American Rights Fund in our Boulder, Colorado office. I'm responsible for the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative there, and I'm also a Stanford Law grad from 1996. Hini Karagi, uh, my name is Ramiro Hanson Medina. I'm Winnebago from uh, Nebraska, White Earth Chippewa, and Mexican. Uh, my Ho-Chunk name is Wachaihi Maninga. It means cross man or he who walks ferociously. I was born and raised in San Diego, California, and I'm currently a senior at Stanford. Aloha, omahina poi poi o hua priya ka o mea ke ia, no ka wa kani ko o o he e ia o ahu. Um, aloha, my name is Mahina ka o mea. I'm from the kani ko o rain of he e ia on the island of Oahu, and I'm Kanaka Maoli. I'm also a freshman at Stanford University, just starting out this year, probably majoring in comparative studies in race and ethnicity, and minoring in environmental justice. Uh, hello, my name is Neil Maraza Keyswood. Uh, I'm of the Navajo and Chichimeca people, uh, an alumni of the Policy Organization Leadership Studies program uh, in the Graduate School of Education uh, from the year 2020. I'm currently affiliated with Northwestern, and I work there with our uh, undergraduate admissions doing Native recruitment. Peacemaking is a lot of things. Um, I think at its simplest level, it's a community-based, culturally informed way of communicating, of navigating difficult conversations, of building relationships with each other. I often do my work in the dispute resolution space um, where I'm helping people think about how they heal relationships, how they come to reach this level of, of peace with each other. Um, but peacemaking is 
bigger than that. It's a, a way of life. It's about our centering our relationships with each other. Um, it's about prioritizing our community values with each other. It's really an indigenous way of thinking about relationships. It's a way of being. It's a way of knowing. It's a way of teaching. It's a way of sharing. But the purpose is to ground us all in our values, and those values are connected to places. And when we can bring that together, we can affect change that promotes understanding and ultimately heals the fractures that we experience in community, in relationships, um, and on campus. Oftentimes when there's conflict, there's often some sort of imbalance in the relationship. Uh, and so we go through these peacemaking processes to enter into a discussion, a circle process, or just uh, relating on a one-to-one -one basis or as a group um, to understand what are those things that are underlining this conflict or this disagreement um, and how can we air those and enter in with an open heart wanting to address and uh, restore our relationships. And you're trying to invest in community. I think, and that's, you, you enter into peacemaking processes as a community, as bringing in those who are involved in the conflict, involved in the harm. Uh, it could be um, just friends of those who have been harmed or who are going to be those support structures you bring in. Because in many ways, the, even though they might not be directly in, impacted, um, or they might not be the ones that have been directly harmed, they're still in, impacted. And so when we do a talking circle, when we're doing a peacemaking circle, when we're doing Ho'oponopono, it looks like everyone in that circle talking to each other in an equitable, centered way that doesn't have power dynamics, but is purely everyone's hearts beating together so that they can learn from each other, work through hardship, and really learn how to be uh, community members together, whether it's in preventative work or whether it's in conflict resolution. It's always about learning how to be better community members with each other. One, deny the plaintiff defendant binary and the impossible illusion of impartiality. Instead, see yourself as a keeper of stories, a protector of values. Blink away the blame of every legal battle and imagine the creativity we'd birth if we learned to see each other as kin. Relations that whisper in the same winds, eat of the same rocks, mark time by the same tides. He kulena ko leila. The movement really was led by students, and um, I'm really proud of a success, if I can share that. One of the things that we were thrilled to um, actualize was an opportunity to engage peacemaking in a really important student movement around renaming. And um, student leaders had worked for years to rename several campus landmarks bearing the name of Father Junipero Serra, the architect of the California mission system. And they started with resolutions in the Associated Students of Stanford University organizations. They hosted forums, panel discussions, marches. Many of us taught courses. I taught a course on American and religious freedom, and people read Sarah's papers. There was a huge movement around this. I jumped into that renaming committee as an undergraduate student representative who was also able to bring some of the ideas and thoughts of the undergraduate um, and graduate Native student community um, to the table. Towards the very end of my junior year, at, I had been doing um, peacemaking work for about maybe a year and a half. Um, I had worked with my tribal community and the Native American Rights Fund to do some training on peacemaking um, to implement that the peacemaking structures into our tribal court. And I had begun starting to train others a little bit in peacemaking skills and practice my own peacemaking abilities at the university level. Third renaming committee, so these folks who were taking the renaming principles that had been created by the second committee and applying those to the case of Junipero Serra, reached out to Karen Beastman in the Native American Cultural Center saying, we really want to make sure um, that we are communicating with Native students. It culminated in something really important when the renaming committee 
asked me could they meet with Native students, and this was like week nine of spring quarter, which is a very busy time for Native students at Stanford, post powwow, before graduation, before finals, and I said, yes, but you'll come to our space and we'll facilitate the conversation. And what happened in that moment, as Carson brilliantly, masterfully, very respectfully, most inclusively, <laughs> structured a circle with that was based on values of mostly faculty and administrators, and framed questions about harm, so that Native students who were there could share their their heartfelt experiences, because peacemaking gets you out of your head and into your heart, could share their experience about their reaction to these names and whether they were California Indians or others, maybe others who experienced boarding school experiences and intergenerational trauma associated with that loss and understood forced conversion, understood displacement, understood genocide that triggered those kinds of experiences. When they could speak to their heart time after time and there was intentional listening and deep respect and all of us were grounded in our values. What happened in that moment was a transformation. I witnessed it, it, it literally almost brought tears because I could see that these committee members who were, who came in predisposed to think about the intellectual arguments around equity and representation and that sort of thing, they could hear harm. And when they heard harm in their heart, they could connect it to a policy. And that policy resolution, that policy revelation, literally, um, was forthcoming. They recommended to the Board of Trustees and to the President that three campus landmarks bearing Sarah's name be renamed. And they told folks afterwards that it was that experience that was pivotal in their final decision. I think that really established a precedent where Native students were able to say, okay, even if I'm very mad about how XYZ is being handled by the university, I understand that there is a value basis that we can all come to in a way that we can all reach a consensus. So since that point in time, the goodwill and the relationship that's been established there has enabled us to increase recognition of the Muwek Ma'aloni, whose land that we're on, um, at the university level. It's enabled us to continue this practice in our community, and it's enabled us to have these conversations continuing with the administration in a way that they were with us celebrating the actual renaming of all of these monuments on campus, which I think was a, a really beautiful experience. It, it's clear that peacemaking made a real big impact in helping the administration uh, understand the student perspective and understand the indigenous experience. So I think especially in relation to talking to the people that are higher above, that, that are the decision makers, being able to break down those barriers and, and really understand and have conversations as people, I think that is much very necessary. And so I think the renaming around Sarah ha will also continue to be one of those points that Native students and non-Native students look back to is this time where students, staff, and faculty were able to come together, better understand each other, and create change. We're already seeing other folks take forward this idea of renaming and reevaluating other histories that have impacted other marginalized communities on campus. Um, and thinking about what the possibilities are for creating a more community-oriented, more healing-oriented, more restorative campus. When I was in law school, we had a Native American common law class that was taught by one of the justices of the Navajo Nation Supreme Court, Raymond Austin. And Raymond brought in the head peacemaker from the Navajo Nation courts in, uh, for a unit on peacemaking. That's where we learned about it. That was Filmer Bluehouse, who was director of that program at that time. And the Navajo Nation uh, peacemaker courts had been in existence since, I believe, 1980. So they had been pretty well established by then. And uh, I was just hooked at that point right away. I thought, this is something I really love. Um, I had previously taken a year-long course in mediation at the law school, and that was pretty cutting edge at the time. So I was kind of primed for a different way of doing things, and then when I learned about peacemaking, it just felt right. Once I got my job at the Native American Rights Fund that included responsibility for the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative, I got over to Stanford as soon as I could. 
because I knew that Karen Beesman, who was the director of the Native American Community Center and the, the American Indian Program Office, had been teaching federal Indian law and that she included, a, she was at least aware of peacemaking and probably included it in the class. And so I told her about my new job and my responsibilities and she was excited to start collaborating and to bring me in and, and help in any way that we could. We went through a whole lot of steps. We started out what was already available and with guest lectures and units and, and so on, and then talks at the NAC, the Native American Community Center. And then from that, we thought it would be nice to try to work at the design school to see if there were ways to expand the program and ways to expand the teaching methodologies and so on, utilizing a new way of thinking. That was a fun, a fun exercise. We, we gained a little bit of experience there. We gained some nice allies who we worked with and uh, advanced it that much further, gained exposure within, within the university at large. And then it's just kind of grown year by year based on what's available. So we created some courses, a couple of pop-up courses, a course on crafting challenging conversations, where we started with basics. We did courses in Native Studies, CSRE. So it was really exciting to see that kind of impetus sort of emanate out. So I was introduced to peacemaking uh, by Karen Beastman. Um, so as part of my program, uh, one of the final projects or requirements was creating um, a deliverable. So some sort of um, document or you're working with, partnering with some sort of educational organization to, to um, support them in, in some sort of project. My background has been in Indigenous student affairs and student support, so I knew immediately I wanted to work with uh, the Native American Cultural Center. Um, so I remember going into Karen's office, just having a quick meeting, and uh, one of the first things she brought up is just this history of um, of peacemaking at Stanford. So she had introduced me to that legacy in wanting to both document that, but also create start building out um, what would hope, what would become a greater peacemaking initiative. Uh, and so we talked about the creation of a, a peacemaking toolkit. Um, and even in that moment, it was like an aha moment of, uh, this is what I've been looking for. So the peacemaking toolkit is, in essence, an overall introduction to, to what is peacemaking. It's a documentation of what has been put out there in written word. There's so many different perspectives on peacemaking and different approaches based on different communities and tribes. And so that was one of the first aspects of how do we try to capture these different perspectives in a digestible, easy to kind of understand format. As I was digging into the diff reading different stories and hearing from different practitioners, it became very clear that this is a practice that transcends um, continents. And so as Indigenous people that uh, our, our knowledge ways kind of intersected. And so I wanted to kind of bring that to light too and show the ways that we share similar approaches in, in navigating conflict and in, in being in community with each other. And then there's also the aspect of how does peacemaking situate with other forms of conflict resolution? So of course we have our current criminal justice system where folks are entering into adversarial processes and in courtrooms, having other people representing them and not necessarily having those individuals who have been harmed or who have done the harm getting to relate and actually talk through and heal from, from this. Usually it's just causes more trauma entering into those systems. Um, so you have those processes and then restorative justice, transformative justice. And then the other aspect was just documenting what could the future of peacemaking be in higher education and why is it important that we start introducing these other conflict resolution systems in these spaces. An activist, Miriam Kaba, comes, comes into mind as she talked about in one of her talks that universities are really an amazing space for us to start introducing these alternative practices. If it can work here, then we can should be able to apply it into the greater world. Uh, but also, how do we take these leaders now who are uh, gonna go back to their communities and um, carry these teaching with them so that they can also pass it on to their communities. And so it's um, a great space for that. The other instance that comes to mind is um, circle work that I was able to do as a staff member in Moak Mataruk, the indigenous themed dorm on campus. Uh, as we were transitioning back onto campus in the 2020-2021 school year. In the winter and spring of 2020, 
Students were allowed on campus in a very limited capacity. It was one student per room. In the winter for the first 28 days, we were completely isolated. You didn't interact with anybody. Uh, you were barely allowed to like leave your room to exercise. And that was only after a certain period of just staying in your room entirely. So um, as a staff, we were looking for a way to bring community to people and enable people to feel like they were loved and cared about and that there was a place for them in their community background at Stanford, even if we were literally just trapped in our rooms. We started doing Zoom circle work which wasn't something that I'd actually done before that, but we would just establish an order of speaking and then we would follow the circle protocol in a way that allowed people to feel like we were almost sitting together. And then in the spring, once we were able to spend more time together and we were able to actually like be together in person outside, we had um, some students in the house who were not indigenous, which it was really special because we were able to have conversations in the circle about what do our relationships look like? What does it look like for non-Indigenous and Indigenous students to interact in a healthy way where we can answer questions for one another, where um, we can share community backgrounds, understandings of issues that might not align in a way that reflects um, how much we value one another and how much we want to continue to be in community with one another. So the impact of that uh, has been, I think everybody who participated in those circles um, are still in contact with one another. I think that those relationships really like became something um, because we were able to open up to one another and share space in a time that it was so difficult to do so. So peacemaking in our family has always been a tradition. It's been something that we've not fully defined in any definitional way, but it's always been something that my family has done within our family. And this is something that's been passed down for many generations. And so as I got involved with the NAC, I started hearing about this formal practice of peacemaking. And from this learning of this formal practice, I got interested in our culturally specific ways of doing peacemaking in Hawaii. And I came to Ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono is our protocol way of doing a talking circle in order to mend truths by talking through our hearts with each other over a protocol process. Miro and I first, uh, we're both staff members at WECMA and Miro and I decided to use a peacemaking format for the FACES debrief from what FACES is, is basically a a moment where a bunch of students come together, incoming fresh, uh, freshmen watch and listen to a bunch of speeches by Stanford students and former Stanford students about very hard, difficult topics that are meant to entice hard feelings and difficulties and ultimately encourage students to think critically and also see each other in a communal sense. And so we brought a peacemaking circle format into that and co-led that circle. And that was something that a lot of students came to us and we're just really grateful for that kind of space to immediately have a value-based location and central circle to share with each other their feelings, their anxieties about coming to Stanford, and so many more incredibly important things. Those experiences really helped me find ways to connect with others and understand that it's not easy always to open up to other people, but that when you can help someone reach that point of being open and being vulnerable and sharing and having that connection, it can be fruitful for the whole community. I entered this um, inter, inter school, inter university program at Stanford or virtually run by Stanford and the Native American Rights Fund this past summer and that program brought a bunch of Native students together from all around the country and also non-Native students to talk about and learn about from incredible mentors, Justice Yazi of Navajo Nation, Brett Shelton, Karen Beesman, Carson, Smith, all these people came and talked to us and told us and taught us about how peacemaking works, what it is, its future, its meaning 
and also taught us ourselves how to be peacemakers. And that's been something that's been fundamental. The peacemaking class was run by Karen Beesman and Carson Smith. And essentially, we would go to class and most weeks we had guest speakers, whether it was Zoom or people visiting the class that were experienced in peacemaking, experienced in, in tribal courts, um, real life situations, and have traveled the, the world teaching about these peacemaking values and, and practices. And I think it was really special to have those experiences and being able to meet elders of different communities who have been able to support young people just like us and in, in a lot less fortunate situations as well and, and to help them thrive and, and to see the impacts they've made in their communities and the way that they've been able to spread that beyond um, firsthand, you know, in a classroom, sitting side by side, being able to ask them questions was really nice and we would have the chance to practice peacemaking circles and uh, with those elders, with those knowledge holders and it was really special to have that and we created a community in the classroom um, where we we were able to be vulnerable with one another, and I think in the long run that, that helped us grow as not just as peacemaking practitioners, but also as students, as people, and as um, more empathetic people. My decision to join the class, like really speaking back to Native community, it was the strength of like a lot of friendships and like big sibling figures that I knew that really pushed me to take the class. Um, and made me feel really, really comfortable when I was there, especially since I was the only frosh. Um, but once I was there, I felt like it really aligned with a lot of my values, the sort of stability and community that I was seeking in my first quarter. Um, and just having a space to talk about like transitions at an individual level and what it was like to find space within the university, but also what it was like kind of for all of us at a systemic level to find our place within this. PWI, so that was really important to me. I think about being in the peacemaking class and I felt like when I was taking notes, it felt so different than taking notes in any other class where you're taking it for a test. Like, I felt like the things I was writing down were things that I really wanted to implement in my own community or like quotes that I wanted to put into a poem and this happens like every week. Um, and I feel like they're just really similar in the way that I feel like both, both peacemaking and poetry come from the na'o, like instead of being really driven by your mind or by logic, like it comes from your connection to your ancestors and, and your connection to your culture. As a conflict resolution fellow, I focus on a few different projects. Um, the first is creating a institutional footprint for peacemaking, or continuing rather to grow this institutional footprint of peacemaking. This is something that um, Native students, um, staff and faculty have been working on for at least the last six years, if not longer. But in this role, I have been providing peacemaking services to students, staff, and faculty across campus, um, introducing circles to people who've never sat in a circle before, and really challenging the way that they think about their interpersonal relationships. A lot of the work I do, as I was saying earlier, is focused on creating spaces for community building before we're even in this time of dispute. And a lot of the issues that I navigate are really related to identity. Right? They're related to DEI work, they're related to um, systemic issues that our communities are facing um, that are specifically disadvantaging marginalized folks. Since the renaming, I think there's been a stronger collaboration between the Native American Cultural Center, Native students in the university administration about thinking about what this university's role is in caring for the land, in representing or amplifying the voices of Native students on campus, and then thinking about its the university's continuous connection with Mwekma, the Mwekma Ohlone people. Um, I know that this is a constant, you know, we're, we're always going to be on this journey. And I think it also probably led to the creation of my current role as a conflict resolution fellow. Beginning that work in peacemaking then led to um, this institutional desire to really focus on indigenous dispute resolution and community building systems. I would really love to see it become 
something that is our first resort, not necessarily even just when there's conflict, but when there's multiple perspectives on an issue, because that doesn't have to lead to conflict. If we establish these mechanisms and we're able to say to each other, okay, I'm seeing it this way and I think that you're seeing it this way, how can we establish a method so that we know that we're not going to come into an argument about this and so that we can both know that we mutually value the way one another see the situation and so that we can navigate the situation to find a solution that is mutually beneficial and um, that honors both of our understandings. Um, I think having that as a default mechanism in place in the university is naturally going to um, really make peacemaking at Stanford blossom. We need essentially a staff of people, really. Um, we need conflict resolution fellows like Carson Smith um, so that she can go on to law school and have something else going on in her life. Um, and we also need to create an infrastructure so that that type of um, system would have a home. If there are no limitations, the peacemaking community at Stanford could be amazing and a center of excellence for the nation and for the world. I would imagine an indigenous institute of peacemaking at Stanford where um, we are centering indigenous theory and practice around healing and peacemaking, where we are doing peacemaking um, in tribal courts, where we're bringing in indigenous um, psychologists and researchers who can help us think about these resiliency factors that peacemaking um, can can bring into our communities, how it can help make us um, more resilient and how we can heal together through peacemaking structures. I'd want to bring in researchers who are thinking about everything. I mean, how we think about, you know, healing after these like national level um, histories of injustice, how we navigate issues of reconciliation through indigenous peacemaking frameworks. We need the university to recognize the importance of peacemaking. We need other universities and their support. What the community needs in order for that vision to become reality is just more people learning, more people working it through, more leaders coming up and taking it and taking it in their direction to the best of their abilities. And of course we need funding and we need continued leadership from people like Karen Beesman um, and the others who will come up and, and, and do it. And then uh, just more opportunity to grow, more fertile ground. So I think it would be an amazing thing if we have someone who is able to just have their entirety of their time focusing on expanding curriculum, bringing in teaching students and other individuals on campus who want to learn about this process and bringing them into what will hopefully be a bigger movement of, of um, building out future peacemakers. And it's such a pivotal moment where if we start introducing practices like peacemaking, practices that center love and care, in my mind, I, I want to see the start of a bigger movement that as our students go out into the world, they'll start bringing these practices with them and start um, showing others what is possible when it comes to um, any disagreement or even just, not necessarily even just disagreement, but how do we really care for one another in, in a really deeply loving way. In order to do so, we really have to have this community level effort and understanding. And that to me is the core of peacemaking is the idea that all of us see one another, all of us recognize the humanity in one another, and we're committed to working toward a way to move forward and continue um, in community with one another. Two, imprisonment is not an option. Refuse it with the air of everything that you are, and while you are breathing, speak. Speak every he hear into a space of spiritual solidarity. And once the sun rises, kukulukumuhana, the rays of light will cut right through the layers of secrets you tried to hide without knowing. Mahiki. And the entanglement is freed. At the same time, this oki will teach you to see that not all nets were woven to tangle. We weave ourselves into each other each time we tell stories, plant seeds, play in streams, remember our genealogies, demand of each other respect and accountability and love. 
because the people are beautiful already. These are the upana that hold everything we are. Nets of pilina born of nai, I know will never come untied because we are sovereign each time we speak. Each circle refusing the settler state the right to lock up our bodies, shackle stolen footsteps over stolen land, and sending our sacred bones too far from home, dispersing the kulaivi with a single sentence. Each circle rematriating transformative justice through the practice of peacemaking. Three, this is Allah Aina, and we do this till we're free.